one of my dear friends is a slightly older a mentor of mine who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And she kept saying to me, and I'm Jewish, so I don't take this lightly at all, my grandparents lost relatives in the Holocaust. She kept saying to me as we were reading news events, they did this in Germany, they did this in Germany. And I thought she was insane, you know, or at least hyperbolic. And she kept saying, they did this in Germany, they did this in Germany. And she's not talking about the horrific nightmare outcomes of you know, 1938, 1939. She was talking about the early years when Germany was still a working parliamentary democracy, fragile, besieged on all sides, but a working parliamentary democracy with newspapers and human rights lawyers and Bauhaus and fashion and celebrities and a lot of the things we would find recognizable today. Um, and she insisted that I sit down and start reading history of, of the early years, the years when everyone was looking around thinking, Surely this is going to pass. This can't, they, this can't, no, we won't stand for this. Surely it can't get worse than this. Um, and the more I started reading, first the history of the early years, the pressure on this fragile democracy to, and the stripping of that constitution and the closing down of those civil liberties. And then when I started reading the other great tyrants and how Mussolini kind of pioneered the closing down of a fragile democracy in the 20s and then Hitler studied Mussolini and I, then I looked at the 30s in Germany and then I looked at and then Stalin studied Hitler and Hitler studied Stalin and I looked at Stalin in the end of the 30s and then I looked at East Germany in the 50s and Czechoslovakia in 1968, Pinochet's coup in Chile in 1973, the Chinese crackdown on the democracy movement at the end of the 80s, early 90s. Uh, what became clear is that would-be despots on the left or the right, no matter where they are in the world, always take the same ten key steps. They always do the same ten things. Systematically, it's like a blueprint for closing down a democracy. And, and the, the early tyrants, the great tyrants kind of developed it, this technology, and then petty tyrants, tyrants all over Latin America, for instance. Um, we're looking at what's happening in, in Myanmar right now, um, you know, Pakistan they all kind of study it and know what to do to close down democracy or crush a pro-democracy uprising. So it was very disturbing to me that as I read these histories, it was clear that we're seeing the same 10 steps in America today. It's this myth that we're walking around in, which the founders have been horrified at, um, that democracy will always protect us and that what closes down open societies overseas could never happen here. I think I'm pretty specific um, identifying exactly what the steps are and what the dangers are and what the real tipping point actions are. I mean, I think it was a tipping point when the United States Congress agreed to let the state essentially torture people in its control. That was one of those tipping points that if you follow closing societies, you recognize you never want to give the state that power because I invite you, you're so scholarly, you're so well educated, I, I invite you to name, and nobody's been able to do this yet because there isn't one as far as I know, a, a society that created a network of secret prisons where torture takes place, where the state did not eventually end up turning some of those tactics of abuse on domestic. I think what we are all in in America is a state of kind of reptile brain um, uh, tunnel vision that makes it very, very difficult for us to take a sane wide view the way other modern democracies are doing. Let me give you an example. Um, in England, Gordon Brown has said, fighting terror, terror is a crime, not a cause. And they have sustained horrific terrorist attacks for years, the same bad guys that we're fighting. And they are not using that as an excuse to crack down on civil liberties. Let's look at Spain. Spain also experienced a horrible, horrible terror attack, same bad guys. And they are trying those accused in a transparent transparent process using that trial to uphold and showcase democracy. You can see the transcripts on the internet. So yeah, I think all of us, the courts, Congress, and the executive have to kind of snap out of this nightmare and, and look at history and uphold democratic principles. The fourth step that create a surveillance apparatus aimed at ordinary citizens, we have that now. The Washington Post just reported that, you know, when you get on a plane now, they're keeping track of what you're reading on the plane and who's sitting next to you and who you're going to go visit and what their phone number is. Um, and it, in East Germany, a majority of the citizens weren't um, being watched by the Stasi. Only a minority were. But all it took was knowing 
that the Stasi were watching you to subdue a whole population. You know, the fifth step is to uh, infiltrate and harass citizen groups, and the ACLU has many lawsuits underway that that's happening. So that key part of democracy, being able to gather with your neighbors and say, you know, I'm not happy about the war, I am happy about the war. Um, you know, now there are agents among us watching what we say and what we do. The sixth step is to arbitrarily detain and release citizens. Um, this gets really disturbing because, and again, it's a classic fascist tactic, and I use fascist quite conservatively. Um, I use it according to the dictionary definition of when the state starts to use force against an individual in an effort to close down democratic processes, and we're seeing that. Uh, you, you, you can't say we're not seeing that if the president can hold you or me in a cell in solitary confinement for months or years, the st state has that power now. But I was on the TSA watch list. Um, so that every time I got on a plane, uh, I would get this quadruple S security clearance, a security warning on my ticket. And finally, I asked this nice young woman who was searching me, you know, why does this keep happening? And she said, you're on the list. And I said, the list? And then, and you know, I don't think I fit a terrorist profile. As the next step is to target key individuals. And, uh, you know, this was a very effective tactic that most, both Mussolini and uh, the National Socialists developed of, um, for example, uh, Goebbels purged the equivalent of PBS and NPR when he got into power, and then they put pressure on academics in Italy and in Germany at state institutions uh, to coordinate, was the term, um, with the National Socialist ideology, or else they lost their jobs. So people started key figures in society, and they were usually sort of visible performers, entertainers, editors and journalists, academics, and opposition leaders began to find that they would face first smears, then job reprisals or job loss if they didn't support the regime in question, then increasingly criminal sanctions. Um, they would get caught up in uh, ever proliferating laws that criminalize speech, for example, and so more and more kinds of speech became criminalized. Um, and finally, they were just rounded up and arrested, which is what would be despots, as you know, always do. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're waiting for the shoe to drop in Myanmar for those brave, brave monks to be rounded up and arrested. I mean, the extraordinary courage that they have. You know, we have to ask ourselves, do we have that courage? Because it's time for us to be taken to the streets now while we're still relatively safe and not later. I just talked, someone came up to me after a reading yesterday who works in government, and he said, you know that we have to sign this kind of loyalty oath now. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, there's this, they're basically building a dossier on everyone. And it's like the identity card in Germany. I either sign it and let them go through my banking records and check my credit report and talk, you know, find out everything they need to find out about me, um, or else I don't have a job and I lose my house. Um, so target key individuals. There was this drumbeat of, well, charge him with the Espionage Act. And again, journalists in Washington, when they publish classified material, there are talking points where people say, charge him under the Espionage Act. Very scary, because as you know, but most Americans don't know, the last time the 1917 Espionage Act was used was, in fact, to round up people like, I, I keep wanting to say you and me, but certainly people like me, activists, um, people who were, you know, fighting against child labor exploitation, uh, socialists, teachers, um, anti-war critics, journalists, editors, Americans, American citizens, rounding them up w without warrants, right, putting them in prison where some of them were beaten. So that's not a happy sign, the invoking of the 1917 Espionage Act. Eugene Debs got a 10-year sentence under the Espionage Act for giving a speech about the Constitution. And the use of the Espionage Act at the end of the teens silenced dissent in America for a decade. The last thing that you start to see, we're starting to see now, which is the recasting of criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. It is such a classic warning sign of a closing society when the state starts to censure speech and starts to uh, target organizations uh, of dissidents for, for state censure. I really want to stress that what I'm looking at when I look at Germany isn't Nazi outcomes. It's not, I'm not saying we're gonna have crematoria or we're gonna have, you know, a, a, a regime, you know, that, that's so far from what I'm saying. What I'm saying is much more considered and, and very right, which is that there are certain tactics that have been developed and are time-tested 
in closing down a, a modern constitutional democracy. And there are two places where this happened in Italy and Germany that we can learn from. And we're seeing, if you look at 1931, 1932, the beginning of 1933, you'll see things recur. And we owe it to the victims of that Holocaust to learn the lessons of history. Uh, so, and why do I think it's so urgent? Here's why. It's a very good question. Um, what most people think is that democracy is strong. And so if there's a closing down that it goes like this, like a diagonal line on a chart, and that we've got time to stabilize and react, that's not how it works. History shows that democracies close down in a series of what Malcolm Gladwell would call tipping points. And that when certain things start to happen, when certain tipping points have been reached, things start to close down very fast. So there was one such tipping point when we legalized torture, and we don't have to revisit that. We did legalize torture. The second tipping point was when we gave the president the right to say that he can call any of us an enemy combatant. If you look at Stalin and if you look at, at Hitler and what they did was that they began to expand and expand the definition of terrorist. And we're seeing that with the uh, rephrasing of, of sort of uh, animal liberation uh, attacks against property as terrorism, those expanded sentences. But you also start to see more and more people and activities being called treason, traitorous, terrorism, sabotage, espionage. Um, and the final step is to subvert the rule of law and or to make it easier to declare martial law. And again, activists all over the world know what a foolish mistake it is to pass something like the 2007 Defense Authorization Act that gives the president it makes it easier for him to declare martial law. You know that in a closing society, it's a classic tactic. You purge the civil service um, of independent thinkers. You focus especially on lawyers and judges. That's what Goebbels did. And then you don't need a coup because in a close election, if that had happened, it would be the end of America, essentially. It would be over because in a close election, the U.S. attorneys are the ones who have the power to go after and investigate voting rights groups and, and who have the power to really in a closing society, you will still have elections. You just won't have free elections. You won't have uncorrupted elections.